Hello, this is Nate Levy for The Forward. In the 1980s and 90s, the Israel Defense Force began airlifting Ethiopian Jews from Eastern Africa, and the government established a program to integrate them into Israeli society. Today, around 115,000 Ethiopian Jews live in Israel, but their transition from an agricultural to an industrial lifestyle has been exceedingly difficult. According to some figures, nearly half of Ethiopian Israelis are unemployed, and those that are employed tend to have low-paying and manual labor jobs. My guest today is Irene Fertik, who has been working on a book of photographs documenting the lives of Ethiopian Jews in Israel over the past 20 years. Irene, you've witnessed nearly the entire progression of the Ethiopian-Israeli community. What are the major challenges facing them today? Yeah, I, I would say the biggest challenge has been education. They um, have not received good educations, along with many other Israelis. Uh, One-third of um, Israelis do not graduate from high school many, many drop out. And so that's the big major hurdle. The second would be um, a feeling amongst most Israelis that uh, it, whereas it's not really racist, I, I believe, although with some people it is, like anywhere in the world, they see Africans as being inferior, but mostly because of the lack of opportunities and because of the dislocation that every um, family has felt. There's been so many difficult times for so many families. A lot of the families have been sort of broken. There's divorces, there's violence, there's dropouts of the young people, and it's the dislocation has been traumatic on most Ethiopian Israeli families. Not everyone, but many of them. The bright spots are that there is an emphasis by the government and by most uh, Ethiopian Israeli families to get the newer generation, the young people who do get through the education system, higher education, so that the government does pay for tuition for any Ethiopian Israeli that wants to go on in school, whether it be auto mechanics, hairdressing school or university level, they pay for that. And as a result, there are many young Ethiopian Israelis who have graduated colleges, but that doesn't mean they're getting jobs, uh, professional jobs in their area, especially white collar. Let's talk about some specific photographs. When you arrived in Israel in 1992, many of the, the people that you were photographing were still living in these kind of temporary camps. Um, mm -hmm. um, these absorption centers were all over Israel. I highlighted, I went to three, I was only there a month, so I was there photographing the lives of um, these new immigrants in the absorption centers. But uh, the one I concentrated on had a tukul or a hut that was built by Israelis with the help of Ethiopians to allow them a little bit sense of home. This tuko was both the community center and the Bet Knesset where they prayed once a week. You returned to Israel in 1996 uh, when Netanyahu won the election for prime minister. Uh, what was it like for the Ethiopian community to participate in this sort of election for the, for the first time? Mm -hmm. I selected 96 on purpose because I knew it would be the first time in the history of most Ethiopian Jews that they had ever voted in their lives. So many of the elders had to be taught how to write their names. It was quite an event. So I was in Rehovot and Netanya photographing, and even in an absorption center I photographed one family being shown how to vote how to sign an X, because they were very new arrivals. And it was an exciting time. Most Ethiopian Jews voted Likud. They are a very conservative community and very religious community, so they voted Likud instead of labor. In 2006, uh, you had the chance to attend an unveiling. Um, could you talk a little bit about that story and the photos that you took on that day? Yes. I heard as soon as I got there that 
there was an incidence, a high incidence of Ethiopian Israeli youth committing suicide. One to two a week for a time of young Ethiopian Israeli were hanging themselves from the ages of 13 up to maybe 26, 27. It was incredibly traumatic and scary. I said, I have to photograph this, even though it's an a negative, very negative thing, and it's very difficult. I was able to photograph an unveiling three or so months after the funeral of a, an 18-year-old Ethiopian Israeli who had hung herself. But I said, this incidence of suicide has to be documented, even if it's just a gravestone. Most documentary photographers who photograph people are there to celebrate mankind and to change or, or inform at least what's happening in the world that has to be known about and what could be changed. Irene, your photos are moving and informative, uh, and we're looking forward to seeing your book. Thank you for talking with us today. Thank you so much.